Um, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research today. Uh, my name is, oh, I can take this off too while I'm talking. Uh, my name is Sabrina Apple. I am also a graduate student at Rutgers <laughs> working with Blake Sleep Burkhart. Uh, I also listed some of my other collaborators here, including Vadim Semenov, Christoph Bedarath, Anna Rosen, and Jonathan Tan. And I will be talking about how the gas dynamics set the star formation rates of molecular clouds. So we're going to jump down and scale a little bit. Um, and I'm going to start actually by spoiling the entire talk <laughs> so that you have a sense of where I'm trying to go with this. Um, I'll start out by giving some introduction and background and telling you some things you already know. I'll talk about the simulations that I'm using to test uh, these models. And then I'll dive into the, the main part of my research, starting with uh, looking at the density PDF. Um, we'll see that the density PDF is not a pure log normal distribution, that the inclusion of self-gravity produces a power law tail at the high density end. Uh, we'll see that the inclusion of feedback in the form of protocellar outflows produces low density time dependent features. Uh, and we'll see that uh, there is evidence in the density PDF of mass cycling between star forming and non star forming regions within these molecular clouds. I'll then go into ways that we can better quantify the dynamics of the gas using the uh, compression and expansion rates of the gas. We'll see that gravity dominates at high densities and that again, protostellar jets have a significant effect on the dynamics of the gas at low densities in agreement with what we see with the PDFs. And then finally, I will introduce the gas mass flux. So this is uh, again, a way of quantifying the dynamics but one that we can compare directly to the star formation rate. We'll see that this gas mass flux peaks near the transition density, which I'll introduce in a moment. Um, but then it levels off, becomes constant, and matches the star formation rate at this new interesting um, S star value, um, which hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but before we get to all of that, let me tell you some things you already know. <laughs> Uh, galaxy formation and evolution is deeply tied to star formation. So understanding how star formation proceeds is very important. A substantial portion of galaxies is stars. You can see that in this beautiful simulated galaxy. Um, and as Megan very nicely introduced, stellar feedback is really important, even at scales of the IGM. Uh, and part of how we understand uh, stellar feedback and generate these good stellar feedback models is by understanding what's going on with star formation. We have some really good observations of star formation relations. So this is a variation on the Kennecott schmidt relation where we have the star formation rate surface density as a function of the gas mass surface density normalized by the freefall time. Uh, and the interesting thing here is for observations ranging from, you know, the local Milky Way clouds to high redshift disk and starburst galaxies, they all follow this same Kennecott schmidt relation. And indeed, we see that there's an observed star formation efficiency of about 1% at all of these redshifts. So only about 1% of gas is actually converted into stars. And I would really like to understand what is controlling that. There's a lot that we know about how star formation proceeds. We know that you need gravity in order to form stars. Of course, you have to have something that will cause the gas to collapse into a star. We know that the molecular gas out of which stars form is supersonically turbulent, that it's traced with magnetic fields. And then, of course, as soon as you start forming stars, you have stellar feedback. You have protostellar outflows. You have radiative feedback. You have stellar winds. You have supernovae. Uh, brief aside, I will go back and forth between calling them protostellar outflows and jets. When I talk about jets, it is not AGN jets. They are much smaller. So these are jets coming from newly formed stars, although the uh, process is similar. But what I hope all of this is showing you that is, is that these are all cloud scale processes. These are all things that are happening at the scale of individual molecular clouds. And so I would like to argue that it's really important to understand the cloud scale processes that affect star formation. And one of the ways that we can do that analytically is by looking at the density PDF. So the pro density probability distribution function is one of the key tools in many analytic models. It can be used to uh, explain the initial mass function, understand the star formation rate, the star formation efficiency, derive the Kennecott-Schmidt relation. <laughs> it's very, very useful. So this, since I'm going to be talking about it a bunch, let me spend a little bit of time explaining what we're looking at here. Um, on the x-axis, we have the log of the normalized density. So log scale, high density this way, low density that way. Um, and then on the y-axis, we're measuring how much of the gas is at that density. So if you haven't looked at these before, it's basically a histogram, right? 
Um, and there's a lot that we can say about what we expect this distribution to, what shape we expect this distribution to take. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But essentially, this is important because this tells us how much high density gas, star forming gas we have, right? Because stars are only going to form out of the highest density gas. So we can use the PDF to measure how much of our gas is star forming, how much of it is not star forming. And we know this certain things about this distribution. We know from these statistics of supersonic turbulence that turbulence should produce a log normal distribution. And so this low density non-star forming gas that is turbulently supported takes on a log normal distribution. We also expect gravity to produce a power law tail distribution, this sort of on a log log scale, this linear distribution at high densities. And so the burkhart motes 2019 paper and Burkhart 2018 suggested using a piecewise distribution for your analytic description of the density PDF. So a log normal plus power law tail distribution where the log normal is describing our diffuse turbulently supported gas and then the gas that is collapsing into, for, into stars forms a power law tail. If we require this distribution to be continuous and differentiable, we can derive an analytic description of where that transition takes place. So this is this theoretical transition density that I'll talk a bit about on some of my plots. Um, if you care about the formula, it's there. But essentially, it's just describing at what density does the gas become uh, self-gravitating and star forming. So now to present the simulations that I'm looking at to test the, this analytic model and uh, to take a look at the gas dynamics. These are <laughs> two parsec <laughs> across turbulent box simulations. Um, I actually, I'm going to sneakily show results from two, suite, two different suites of simulations, but they're set up very, very similarly. Feel free to ask me about them um, if you care, but it's, it's more or less looking the same, the same setup. So I have one simulation that is just includes self-gravity, so the gas is allowed to collapse under the influence of gravity without anything resisting it. We then add in uh, continuously driven turbulence. We add in magnetic fields, we add in protostellar outflows or jets and winds, and then we add, uh, this last simulation also includes a little bit of radiative feedback. In this case, for this um, scale and uh, stellar mass regime, this is really just a little bit of protostellar heating. It's, uh, we don't form any massive stars in these simulations. Um, so there's not really any ionization. And then we can take a look at things like the star formation rate and star formation efficiency for these simulations. And we see that as you add more physics, um, it takes longer and longer for stars to form. So this upper panel is the integrated star formation efficiency. This is what percentage of the initial gas mass has been formed into stars. If we only have gravity, it basically all collapses into stars right away. <laughs> but as we add turbulence, as we add magnetic fields and then various forms of feedback, it takes longer and longer for that to happen. And that is reflected in this lower panel where we have the star formation rate as a function of time. And we see, you know, there's quite a bit of variation, but the star formation rate slowly steps down as you add more physics. This is also visible in this, yes, it is playing, beautiful movie of, um, this is the first four of the simulations, because unfortunately trying to fit five things compactly is hard. Um, and you'll see in these movies, it's a little hard to read the numbers down at the bottom, but you can see that the uh, upper left is gravity only. It collapses directly into sink particles. Once we add turbulence in the upper right, it takes much longer for uh, sink particles to form. The uh, morphology of the gas, just the way that it looks, is different as soon as you add magnetic, magnetic fields in the lower left. And then this lower right includes jets. And if you're looking really closely, you can see the actually see the signatures of the jets being blasted out into the surrounding ism and of course that simulation takes the absolute longest to run because we have so many things that are opposing star formation in this case so let's take a look at some density pdfs the that thing that i spent a bunch of time describing earlier if we take a look at the pdf for just gravity it all forms a power law tail as we expect um, on each of these plots, I'll be showing a couple different things. The vertical line is the transition density, so that's where we would theoretically expect distribution to switch from a log normal to a power law tail distribution, and a reference power law tail with a particular slope, if you're curious. If we then add turbulence and magnetic fields, 
we still see the power law tail due to self gravity at high densities, but we now also see a clear log normal distribution in the low density gas. So our low density gas is turbulently supported, not forming stars. High density gas has a parallel tail. Cool. This is what we hope to see. However, when we add outflows, this is adding protostellar outflows, we now see the, we, we still see the parallel tail, we still see the log normal distribution, but we now also have these low density, um, non log normal time varying features. So this is indicating that we, uh, as expected actually, have uh, outflows driving high density gas out of high density regions and into low density regions. If we divide this PDF, PDF up into chunks, right, we can add up how much gas we have in the power law tail versus how much gas we have in the log normal versus our total gas, et cetera. And we get a plot that looks like this. So this is just total uh, solar masses. In the, the blue is the stellar mass. Green is our power law tail mass. And then the purple is the log normal um, distribution, so low density gas. And the main thing I want you to, and then of course we can do that for all four simulations. And the main thing I want to point out here is that the power law tail, this green line, is relatively constant in time for all of these distributions, or for all of these simulations. This made me wonder though, if I can more closely compare the, because this, this X axis, or this Y axis is really inconvenient. I wanted to see if I could more carefully compare the log normal and power law tail masses. Um, and so we can kind of turn this on its head, if you will, and look instead at the mass loss for each of these quantities. So this is instead of the total mass in the power law tail, this is how much mass is being removed from the power law tail, or the uh, negative of the cumulative change in mass uh, for each of these quantities, as compared to the stellar mass, which is just the stellar mass. And the thing that I want to point out here is that the growth in the stellar mass very closely correlates with the mass lost from the log normal peak. What is this telling us? So this is telling us that this diff diffuse turbulently supported gas is losing mass at about the same rate that we're forming sink particles. So this is telling us that as uh, gas is being removed from the power law tail forming sink particles, that power law tail is being rapidly replenished from the log normal. So this is already telling us some really interesting things about how gas is moving between high and low density regions within our simulation. And this led me to wonder if there was some way we could further quantify the dynamics, because this is a little bit like, they really kind of line up, but I really wanted to dig into this a bit more. And this led us to looking at the divergence of the velocity field. So we can take the continuity equation, we can take the divergence of the velocity field, we can compare that to the density of the gas, and we get a plot that looks like this. So on the x-axis, we have the exact same x-axis as the density PDFs. This is still just the log of the normalized density. But now we have the median rate of at which gas is expanding. Um, and then I'm also throwing in median and time plus. So the, the, the spread, the shaded regions, is how much it varies in time. We can also look at the uh, compressing gas. Um, so a little bit of nitty gritty details. So basically each cell is either expanding or compressing and we're dividing things up into compressing versus expanding gas. The main thing I wanna point out here is that gravity is dominating at high densities for the compressing gas, right? So the purple line is only gravity. All of our simulations match the behavior of the gravity only run at high densities, suggesting that gravity is playing the main role there. It's kind of what we would expect from everything we've seen so far. However, the inclusion of stellar feedback has a very significant effect on the dynamics of at low densities. We can take a look at the net rate, so take the volume average, volume weighted average of these quantities, and see overall what the gas is doing as a function of density. Um, and it, because it's positive at most densities, this tells us that the gas is net compressing at most densities, agreeing with the fact that our simulations are star forming. Um, turbulence is producing substantial increases in both compressing and expanding gas. You can see that in the change between the gravity only run and the turbulence run, where we have this substantial increase in both compression, compressive motions and expanding motions. We can then take this uh, information about the rate of the gas, the uh, compression and expansion rates, and combine it with what we know about how much gas we have at each density. We can get something called what I'm calling the gas mass flux. So this is in solar masses per year, how fast is gas, how much gas is expanding or compressing. 
You can do the same thing, look at both the compressing and expanding gas. Um, and then we can compare it to the average star formation rate, which is cool. So these horizontal lines are the average star formation rate for the simulation as compared with the um, total or average in, or median in time uh, gas mass fluxes. There's a couple of features to point out. Um, the gas mass flux reflects both features of the density PDF and of the net rate that I was just showing you. So the flux peaks around the average densities because that's where we have the most gas, but it also peaks at really high densities for the compressing gas because that's where the gas is moving the fastest. I can then add these together and get a net rate. So a net is gas um, compressing or expanding. The plot that I have for that, I've sneakily switched using a linear scale on the y-axis so that it emphasizes the features of this plot. Um, and so that you can see the slight negative value right before the average density. The main things I wanna point out here is that we have this really interesting peak in the net gas mass flux at this transition density. So at the point where uh, our gas is transitioning from being turbulently supported to uh, gravity taking over, our flux peaks, but then it drops off as we move to higher densities. So something is slowing the gas down and preventing it from uh, collapsing until we reach this point where our net gas mass flux is matching our star formation rate. So I'm calling this S star. I don't, I, I would like to understand what is setting this density. Um, but you can see this is happening for, the gravity is kind of doing its own thing in this particular case, but for the runs that include at least gravity and turbulence, the net gas mass flux is plateauing, matching with the star formation rate. I will point out this is not just a feature of uh, the uh, existence of sink particles, it's not just a numerical effect. Um, this weird spike probably is, this is the density at which sink particles form, so this is sink formation uh, density threshold. Um, and I'd like to dig in a bit more to see what's causing that. But before we even form sink particles, so this is a single snapshot from before any sink particles have formed, we already see this plateau forming. So the fact that our net gas mass flux is peaking, dropping off, plateauing, is already happening before sink particles form. So it's not just a numerical effect of sinks. We can... Also take a look at the value of the net gas mass flux at these densities as a function of, okay, <laughs> not a lot of time, as a function of time. Um, and the main thing to point out here, uh, as expected, the net gas mass flux at the transition density, way higher than the um, star formation rate, which is the heavy black line. Um, but the gas mass flux near this, this new S star value is very cl closely tracking the star formation rate. It's not exact. But when we have these substantial features in the star formation rate and time, um, it's reflected in a uh, net gas mass flux. So what this is telling us is that the gas mass flux near S star is clearly playing an important role in setting the star formation rate. And before I, I leave, I would like to very quickly say a few words about um, how this can connect to machine learning and data science. Of course, I, I hope that I have made a case for the use of these sort of small turbulent boxes as sort of laboratory tests, right? We can use these suites of smaller simulations to vary our models and vary our parameters and test results from uh, other investigations. Um, sort of looking the other way, I would really like to find ways um, that my work can inform things like subgrid models. I'm particularly excited to see how I can take this S star quantity um, and adapt it to a hopefully useful subgrid model for galaxy simulations. Um, and then finally, I think it'd be really interesting to look at whether we can use symbolic regression to tell us a bit more about analytic models of star formation at smaller scales. And with that, just leave my conclusions. <laughs> Um, do you have any questions? So until everybody comes up with questions, I have a couple of questions. So I um, was wondering how you model your star formation efficiency, uh, because I would expect that um, at least observationally using different traces that trace mm -hmm. different densities of uh, gas mass, for example, gas densities, mm -hmm. uh, you would have different star formation efficiencies. Yes. So uh, right. uh, these are... Um, 
Yes, so the, the scale of these simulations are, they're all, basically you can think of them as the like dense inner portion of a molecular cloud, right? So they're, I, they're cold enough that they're, and dense enough that they're effectively isothermal. We actually have a polytropic equation of state, but we stay within a density region, regime where it's isothermal and approximately 10 kelvins. Um, we uh, simulate star formation by forming sink particles. So when gas reaches a particular density threshold, it forms a, a sink particle that then can contribute, continue to accrete high density gas. Um, and so our stellar mass quantity is just the total mass contained within those sink, sink particles. So these particular simulations do not uh, simulate an IMF uh, in any way. Uh, I'm actually working on another simulation code that does approximate an IMF, and I think that'll be an interesting thing to look at is see how any of these results change if we have more realistic um, stellar evolution and uh, IMF. Does magnetic fields play a significant part in that? Yes. So I actually have a backup slide. Yay, I get to use backup slides. Um, I think this is the one that I want to show. So what's interesting here is this is tracking um, it's the same thing, top and bottom, except the upper row is log scale on the y-axis. So this is tracking the mass in individual sink particles as a function of time for each of the simulations. And the thing that's really interesting here is, of course, uh, when you only have gravity, everything collapses really fast into a bunch of fairly small sink particles. So you can see that the, the maximum mass of any given sink particle never gets very big. As you add turbulence, you kind of, you just slow down the collapse in general. And so individual sink particles have more time to accrete. But then magnetic fields slow that down so much that you actually only form four sink particles for the uh, magnetic field simulation. Um, so the inclusion of magnetic fields significantly decreases fragmentation of the gas. Um, adding various forms of protocellular feedback back in then increases fragmentation again, but it also just increases the amount of time that the simulation has to form sink particles because star formation is so, becomes so slow. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah that, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, yep. Josh. Here's Josh Big again. Um, so I'm curious, I think maybe you and I have talked about this before, but I'm, I'm curious, <laughs> probably, um, but I'm curious about this. Um, this thing that I sometimes call density destiny. Mm -hmm. So I want to know if I'm a particle and I'm equally likely to, I'm, a, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a particle at some volume density and I'm equally likely to reach say a, a sink density or mm -hmm. near a sink density, or say maybe the peak of the PDF. So mm -hmm. a low density regime, but not like the lowest density regime. Mm -hmm. Like what density is that where you're just as likely to go, go out to a low density as to go up to a high density? Do you see I'm what I'm asking? Not, I think so, and I'm not sure. I'm, I'm also not entirely sure how you would measure that with these particular simulations. Yeah, you don't have tracers, right? Tracer particles. Yeah, yeah. So if you had tracer particles, then you could measure that. Yeah. Um, I don't have tracer particles. Yeah. So, yes. Or do I have tracer particles? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Like sleeper card. Um, <laughs> I think, I think, yeah, like where the expanding and compressing gas is equal is like you're equally uh, likely to go in either direction. At least in the sense that you have equal quantities of gas that is expanding and it is compressing. Actually, maybe net rate. So around here where things are around the mean density where we're basically at zero gas, I guess, would be we don't have a net movement towards higher or towards lower densities. Hmm. Um, yeah, gas in that bin is basically going in both ways equally. Yeah. And as you move towards that dashed line, that's the post-shock density. That's right. where shocks are piling up. So that's why you get this mm -hmm. enhancement there. And then it's like game over. You're going to go into a star. It's just a matter of what time scale, right? So it's, it's slower than the free fall time scale, but like you're on your way to a star. Yeah. Right, right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I, I think this plot's super interesting. Thank you. Um, and Blake, so you kind of answered my first question, which was <laughs> why the peak on the left. But um, I guess maybe you said it and I didn't really catch it, but I, I don't understand why you're getting this plateau. I see what you mean is it's not a feature of the, like, the numerical. Situation. That, I mean, it's something I want to dig more into. Um, 
my so my understanding is that yeah so we're reaching the post shock density and then rather than gas you know continuing to accelerate into um, star particles they're all of and, and in fact in the gravity only case you can kind of see that the gravity only case is this purple line it just keeps going up um, but for all of the other simulations we have all of these other physical processes that are slowing down star formation um, so that's how I think of it in my head is you have these other things like turbulence like magnetic fields in particular that are sort of slowing down that collapse and resisting collapse into the really high density gas. Why? <laughs> yes, that is true. Yeah. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other thing I'll say is I think there's also a little bit of comp competition with um, as you're forming sink particles potentially you could have some impacts from accretion, right? So there is that accretion process. I don't know if we really resolve disks by any stretch of the imagination in these simulations, but theoretically you could imagine kind of like forming disk part uh, disks around your stars and that that's going to have an impact on the dyna dynamics, the lowest, lowest, or highest, <laughs> far, farthest right densities. Yeah, I, I, I'll just chime in. Like we, what, what we think is happening there is fragmentation. Like, so you add turbulence in and it changes the fragmentation and that's where disks are forming. So angular momentum's probably becoming dominant on yeah. that scale. There's other studies that kind of agree with that density roughly being like a disk formation yeah. density. All... So that's probably what's going on. And I mean, Sabrina's gonna look into that a little further. Yeah, but that seems to be where the disk is forming that changes the way that the mass flux is accreting onto the sink. There's also a couple uh, studies that have looked at um, the possibility that you have a double power law. So a log normal distribution that switches to a power law that then switches to another power law at some density. I don't know that it's the same density, but one of the things I want to look at is whether there's any relation between what that density of like forming that second power law that probably has to do with disks and the accretion process and whether that's at all related to where this plateau is happening. All right. Um, so I guess it's also time. So let's thank Rina. Thank you.